I want to talk this morning about lift, and I'm going to be spending the next several weeks talking about lift. Lift can mean a lot of different things. A plane lifts up off the ground when it takes off in the air. Uh, an elevator, in, in England they actually call elevators lifts, and an elevator lifts us up to a higher floor. A parent might lift up their child when they're playing with their child, giving that child a different perspective on life. And then you have weightlifters who lift weights in the air to gain greater strength. Lift can mean a lot of different things, but um, lift is, is really, it's the action or the, or the place to move something or someone to a higher position. Webster's also defines lift as to rise up from the ground or some other surface, or to move someone or something to a higher condition or position. And so as we embark into this year, we've kind of started rolling now into 2015. We're a couple of weeks into this new year. I want us to begin focusing on the fact that God has spiritual lift for each of our lives, that there is something that places that he wants to bring us to a higher condition, a better place in him. He doesn't want to just leave us where we've been. And you know, this world, when we come to know the Lord, we, we are often uh, found so beat down by the world and beat down by the things of life. This world is, is in a sinful condition. People who aren't serving God treat each other in a sinful manner. Even sometimes Christians treat one another in sinful manners. And with that, people can be left in a really lower condition. And God said that, I used to love this old hymn that we used to sing, that he took me out of the miry clay, he set my feet on a rock to stay. God wants to lift us to that higher, that better place. So as we're coming into this year, and as we're looking at this first month, I want us to really focus on how can God lift us this year. James 4.10 says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. If you stop and take a look at that verse for a second, you'll realize something that the lift in this verse is nothing that we are doing. A lot of times I think that we try, um, just as people in general, it is our nature to try and always lift ourselves up. It's our nature to, uh, we sometimes want to elevate our position, sometimes we want to elevate our financial status. Maybe we want to elevate or lift up our health condition. And we like to often try and lift ourselves. We try to lift our moods through, through um, drugs and alcohol and, and, and partying and, and just different things that will maybe make us happy, entertainment parks, different things. But to really find true lift, to be truly elevated to that higher stage, James calls us to this one thing. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Well, humility means to go down. Humility means to lay down. Humility means to, to descend, not to elevate. But when we surrender ourselves to the word of God, when we surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ, when we surrender ourselves to God's plan, his will in our life, what we're promised in scripture is that when we stop taking control for ourselves and give it over to God, then God will then turn and lift us up. And I don't know about you, but God can lift me up higher than I can lift myself. God can lift me to a better place than I will ever be able to lift myself in that. As we start this morning, this first message, I want to talk to you about lifting our mood. Lifting our mood. Jesus wants to lift our mood. There are so many things, again, because this world is filled with sinful people, and sinful people can do mean things. Even Christian people can do mean things. And, you know, in this world today, a lot of people are discouraged. They're depressed. They've been hurt. They've been broken. Some people are angry. They're bitter. They're carried around woundedness. Others are prideful and stressed out. Some are anxious and have no rest in their heart. And, and our moods can be a great reflection of a lot of things going on in our lives and different things that affect us in different ways. Oh, we might do the good smile and put on the good smile. Hi, how are you doing? But underneath, we really know what our moods truly are. But Jesus doesn't want to just help fix your outer appearance. He wants to fix your inner side. And he wants to help lift the mood of our hearts. And so this morning I want to start by talking about lifting our mood. And I want to start that with talking how he wants to lift us from heaviness to praise. Isaiah 61.3 says, To console those in, who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, they, that he might be glorified. Jesus 
when he came to earth, fulfilled these prophecies. In fact, in, in a few moments I'll read to you Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, where it talks about the Spirit of the Lord sending him and anointing him to break, to, to heal the brokenhearted, to set the captive free. He came to lift our mood. He came to free us from the ashes of mourning, the ashes that sin bring upon our life, the darkness, the heaviness. Now that word heaviness that we see here in this, in this passage of Scripture it really relates to that place that when we go into depression, when we go into discouragement or despair, sometimes we feel that heaviness. You can feel it on your chest. You might have that, that discouragement that makes you want to just go crawl up in bed, pull the sheets over your head, and just kind of disappear from the world. Sometimes we feel that heaviness from the weight of sin where it's setting or, the, or problems that rest on our shoulders and we just feel weighed down from them. That's what it's referring to physically in the sense of heaviness. And the Hebrew word here says keha, which means Actually, a dark place or somewhere that faint, dim, colorless. You know, if you stop and think about it, when despair comes into our life, all of a sudden things might not seem black and white. Seem, things might not seem colorful. They seem skewed. And because our perspective becomes skewed, that our perspective gets off base, and we don't see things as clearly as we should, that's what heaviness can do to us. It brings us to a dark place that might be filled with pain robbed of hope, robbed of joy, that weight that sinks down in our spirits that we feel is never going to go away. The author here also, the prophet, when he says heaviness, he doesn't just say, just refer to it as heaviness, but he refers to it as a spirit of heaviness. Now there's a reason for that. There are three kinds of spirits that exist in this world. There's the Holy Spirit, um, there's human spirits, and there's angelic spirit. And that angelic spirit is broken into that which is good, which, is, which are the angels of heaven, and then that which is evil, which are the demons of hell. And we need to be aware today that there are real demonic spirits that exist in this world. Some people think of the devil as being a mythological creature or just a, a, a picture of a figment of evil in the world, but he's real. Lucifer existed. He was a created being by God. He fell from heaven, and with him he took a bunch of, uh, a bunch of angels who are now referred to as demons. If the Bible tells us that it's a spirit of heaviness, it's referring to us that there is an actual demonic entity that's attached to that heaviness. And a lot of times when we go into those places of depression, it doesn't mean that we're possessed or anything like that, but it means that there might be spiritual things, spiritual authorities and principalities that are weighing us down and bringing that depression, that heaviness upon our heart because the enemy wants to hold us in a place of discouragement and despair to rob us of our faith, to rob us of our hope, to rob us of the things that God wants to do in our lives. He brings us into places of mourning, places of, uh, of, of feeling just lost and without any hope. But then Scripture tells us that to trade in for that spirit of heaviness, to put on a garment of praise. The garment of praise, not a term that we use a lot in our society today. The church used to refer to it a lot. In fact, we used to have courses that we sang about put on the garment of praise. and People might not have understood, well, what does that mean? But the garment of praise was actually referring to a majestic robe that a king would, would put on for a celebration. And uh, that was actually the garment that was being referred to in this element. Not necessarily the garment of praise, but the garment itself. And so if a king would put on this garment, this majestic robe, it, for celebration, it's telling us that when we go to praise God, it's like saying, I'm going to put off the heaviness, I'm going to praise God, I'm going to go out and prepare to celebrate. There's a reason why we praise in the church. There's a reason why we open up worship services with a time of singing and praise. Because when we praise God, we are doing a couple of things. We are we're remembering the things that God has done. Praise calls out the mighty things that God has done, the miracles that he's brought forth. Praise recognizes God for who he is, his greatness, his strength, his ability, the salvation that he might bring into our hearts. Praise looks to the things that God's going to do and the way that God's going to affect us or the way God is going to help us. So when we begin to praise God, we all of a sudden put ourselves in a lower position, but we're putting him as we elevate him. We begin focusing on how amazing and awesome God is and what he wants to do. Now, if you then take that and combine that with this concept of the garment, which is putting on a majestic robe, it's telling us really as children of the king to be ready to put on celebration because we're joint heirs with Christ. We're children of the king, joint heirs with Jesus, and we have an inheritance with Christ that we know that our end is not destruction, but our end is hope. And our end is good. And so if we're doing that, when we go to praise God, we know that we're releasing God to be in control of all of those circumstances. Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2 says, 
And Jesus would later say this in Luke chapter 4. The Spirit of the Lord is God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. And then he goes on to the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You see, Jesus was given to us, Jesus came to this earth to change the mood, to change the condition of man, to change us from being bound by sin, to being free, to change us from being blind, to being able to see spiritually and even physically, to change those who are sick to be made whole. And as Jesus came to make these changes in our life, as he came to do this for us, he lifts our mood to these things. And as we praise, we enact him to be able to do that. In Romans 8, verses 18, Paul says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. You know, a lot of times in our lives, even though we choose to praise the Lord, we don't necessarily see the sufferings in our life go away. We're still sometimes left in those circumstances. We're left in those situations. And we sometimes think, well, why would God leave me to still go through these sufferings and expect me to be able to praise him and expect to lift my mood even though I'm going through suffering? Well, there's something that we need to realize, that, that God can use suffering for purposes in our life. Christ can, not that he's wanting to bring them upon us, but we are intended for something greater than this earth. We're intended for the hope of glory. And God is wanting to transform our lives and turn them into something beautiful. And sometimes through the suffering, God brings beauty into our lives. Let me give you a little picture of the emperor moth. Let's start off with a caterpillar if we could. This is an emperor moth caterpillar. Not the most amazing looking thing. Maybe kind of an interesting little worm, but not the most amazing thing. Just this little green bug crawls along on the branches, maybe in the grass, maybe in the trees. He's nothing, he can't fly, he's kind of stuck in his habitat where he is, he can't fly above anything. But one day this, this caterpillar is going to turn into a, a beautiful moth. Most moths are not beautiful, but the emperor moth actually is a beautiful moth. It's got a lot of color to it. And one day he's going to be transformed after he goes through a process. In our lives, often, God is taking us out of the world and he's transforming us to get ready for heaven. He's transforming our lives for future things he wants to do in and through us. And so he's going to bring us through a metamorphosis, almost like this caterpillar goes through a metamorphosis. He goes, and this caterpillar will spin a cocoon. And here's the emperor moth cocoon. And, you know, if you look at this, it's kind of a big bulb. That's where the moth is down below. But if you look at the top, it's kind of almost bottlenecked. It's smaller at the top. He now has to break through that top opening to become this next picture. That hole's not that big, is it? He's got to break through in order to get out of the hole so he can become this moth with his beauty now in display, no longer the little bug that people step on and squish until the guts come flying out. Did you ever do that when you were a kid? I used to do that. when I, I, I told the story in the last service about when I was 12 years old, the, the, the gypsy moth came through the New England states. I, I did, I'm saying the story just because I want to be able to say the New England states because the Pats won yesterday. And because and, uh, the Saints are out of this situation so I can actually recognize the Pats for winning now. The, uh, and uh, that's, that's my home area. And I remember the gypsy moths came and they ate every leaf on every tree. July looked like the middle of January because there was nothing green left. They had eaten everything. It was this huge thing. They covered the roads. They covered the trees. They hung down. They were kind of nasty. And we'd go out and we'd just kind of step on them and squish them. Sometimes we'd try to step on four or five at once and see which way they'd squish out. And so that was kind of the thing that 12-year-old boys do, you know. But... The caterpillar eventually gives way to the moth who flies above all these situations, who flies above the problems, flies above. But you know, if that moth does not go through that cocoon, can we go back to the cocoon for a second? If he does not go through that small opening, science tells us he'll never be able to fly. You see, that tight, small opening, the pressure from that opening, the pressure going through, even though he will struggle for days to break out of that cocoon, the pressure when he goes through that hole actually causes his body to release fluid into his wings so they aren't just big wings that sit there and lay there but actually have strength to fly when he gets out. In fact, the person, I, I read about the story in a devotional and this guy was talking about 
he was watching his, his emperor moth try to break out of the cocoon for days. He felt so bad for it, thinking maybe because he had captured it and was holding it in captivity that it was struggling. So he decided to trim the cocoon to make it easier for the moth to get out. And the moth came out very easily once he did that, kind of flopped out onto the desk. The guy could see the beauty of its wings and, and thought, wow, I helped it out. But then the moth couldn't do anything. It couldn't get up and fly. It couldn't move, and it died within minutes. And you see, sometimes the sufferings that we experience in this present life, like Paul said, really what they're doing, they're not to be compared to the, they can't be compared with how glorious it will be afterwards. Just like the moth might have to go through some suffering to get out of that cocoon, but afterwards his glory will be discovered. And sometimes God's working that in our lives, but in the midst of that, in the midst of those sufferings, we need to realize that we can lift our mood by engaging in praise. Because as we look to praise, what we're doing is we're looking to the hope. We're looking to the future. We're looking to the glory that God has. We're looking to what God is going to do. And praise helps lift the mood of heaviness in our lives. Let's talk about the next mood I want to speak of, which is lift, being lifted from anger to forgiveness. From anger to forgiveness. How many know that anger is a real emotion? If I asked any of you if you never got angry, no, I don't think there's a person in this room who could say they never have been angry. And if you did, I don't believe you. We've all been angry at times. Anger itself is an emotion. It is not sin. What we do with anger very quickly and often and the majority of time will become sin if we don't rein it in. Scripture tells us in Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. The devil knows what he wants to do. He wants to bring about situations in our lives that will make us angry. Angry. He wants to bring hurt. He wants people to wound us. He wants, he wants situations to make us upset. He wants to remove control from things in our lives. Because by doing those things, often we can become angry people. And if we become angry in our hearts and we become angry at other people, he knows that he can create division. He knows he can split people apart. He can break up families. He can, he can get people away from their jobs, and he can cause them to bring greater destruction into their lives. There are a lot of things he can accomplish in us if he can get people to get angry and act upon that anger. So we have to deal with it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. How is it that we deal with anger? The antidote for anger and the antidote to becoming bitter is forgiveness. Now, let's stop for a minute because I think we've all known people in our lives who maybe have had bitterness in their hearts. And you know, a lot of people have been through a lot of things. Sometimes there's some of us in this room, as a child, you were abused. You might have been physically abused, you might have been sexually abused, you might have been abused in different ways, you might have been emotionally abused, but you might have been abused. There are others you've been through marriages, and you might have been through abuses in your marriage, or you might have been through a bad breakup, or someone might have broken your trust and cheated on you, or whatever happened, and you're feeling anger about those things. You might have been treated unfairly at a job. There might, you might have had a friend betray you, stab you in the back. I mean, there are things that happen in all of our lives on a regular basis that bring anger into our hearts. But this book, the Word of God, the Bible, from the opening, from the opening chapters is a story of God's forgiveness. Because God made man, and what did man do? He sinned. And the rest of it is a story of God making a way to forgive man. God's plan for bringing forgiveness to mankind. He didn't do that so we could just go on and then be angry with other people, but he forgave us that we would then in turn, like him, forgive other people. That freely as we have received, freely we need to give unto others. Because if we hold on to anger, and we, and we often like to hold on to anger. You know, a few years ago I was reading, when I was working on one of my degrees, I was working, studying on anger in a counseling book, and it talked about how when good people make, make good people angry. When good people make good people angry, because none of us is perfect, and we can each, without even attempting, we can do things to offend or turn other people and make them angry. But it says when it does that, often because we want to hold on to the anger because in our loss of control or in our feeling of being victimized by the other person or because the other person has offended us, in order to hold on to that offense, we have to hold that other person in a place of disrespect, and we often have to villainize the other person. So we have to all of a sudden make a good person into a bad person so we can justify our anger at that person. And the whole premise of, the, of this chapter of this book was about talking about how just because someone has hurt us in some way doesn't mean that we get to turn them into being a bad person 
so we can justify our anger. Although that's what we often want to do. We want to have to, we want to have to pull down character. We want to find other fault with that person. Because what we do is we begin to hold them in this debtor's prison. We hold them in debt to what they've done to us. And so in order to do that, we have to cause them to have to pay more up on those debts because they owe us. You know what, you talk, what I'm talking about? When someone hurts you, they owe you now. They, have to, they owe you something because they did you wrong. And now they need to do something to make up for it. This is what Jesus says about forgiveness and debts and debtors. In Matthew 6, verses 12 to 15, he says, And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in verse 14, Jesus begins to expound. He says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Take a think about that for a second. Really think about that for a second. That's pretty strong language. It's a pretty strong statement right there. And I'm not saying that Jesus said it. We need to forgive others their debts as Jesus has forgiven our debts. And if we choose not to forgive others their trespasses against us, it says that the Father will not forgive us. Not because God ha Jesus hasn't died. It's not because Jesus hasn't paid the price. It's not because Jesus hasn't already shed his blood and made a way. But what happens is when we choose to not forgive, we create an obstacle to the mercy of God forgiving us. And we stop the flow of God's grace and mercy towards us because we've refused to send it on to others. Now, Jesus even goes as far as to tell another parable about this. And he tells a story about this guy who owed, the, who owed his master millions of dollars, what would be equivalent today to millions of dollars. He had such great debt to him that he could. there's no way in his entire lifetime he could work 24-7 for his entire life and ever pay off this debt. And the master forgives him the debt, and says, you're completely free. I hold nothing against you anymore. That's what Jesus has done for us. He paid a debt we couldn't pay. He didn't owe it, but he paid it for us. He took care of it. And then that servant goes out and finds another servant and says, hey, you owe me 20 bucks. Pay up now or I'm having you thrown into jail. You don't have it? Fine. I got the cops here. They're going to take you off to jail for debtor's prison. You're set. You're done. Can you imagine if someone forgave you of a couple million dollars and you shook someone down for 20 bucks? Or 100 bucks, even 1,000 bucks. You just got forgiven of millions of dollars of debt and you're going to shake somebody else down for, for a menial amount of money. And Jesus said, if you do that, my father will throw you into the lake of fire where they'll be weeping and gnashing their teeth. Because that's how much God says, hey, this whole thing is about forgiveness. And Freely you have received, Matthew 10, verse 8, freely give. You've received the forgiveness of God freely, now extend the forgiveness of God freely. As God has sent it to you, you need to send it on to others. The cure for anger, the cure for bitterness is to forgive. But we need to realize something. When we choose to forgive others who have harmed us, you might say, well, pastor, you know, I, that person killed my, my, my family member. That person, I, I've known people, I, I've, I've watched families where one family member kill, killed the mother. I, I've watched people who've gone through and been through situations of rape. I've seen people in horrible abuses. But you don't know what they've done to me. Yes, but you know what? We transgress God, he forgave us. And if you forgive them, you're going to release the power of God in your life. Because what forgiveness does is it releases you from bitterness. Because what we're doing is we're humbling ourselves to what we think we should do. We need to hold that debt. And as we let go of that, we humble ourselves before God's word and what it tells us to do. And what does the promise say? And he will lift you up. He will lift you up. He will lift your mood out of that anger and into that place of forgiveness. The third mood that I want to talk about is that God wants to lift our mood from unrest to peace. From unrest to peace. You know, there's this mood of being uneasy, having unrest, anxiety. Fear. It's a horrible mood when people get trapped into that place of just having that anxiousness all about them. And, and they're scared of situations. They're scared of life. A lot of times, 
fear is really the result of, 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 of being faced or threatened with loss. So when we're threatened with loss, we don't want to lose something. Our pride tells us, I don't want to lose that. If I lose that, then I won't have as much as I had before. You know, people, the, the very base of hoarding, and if you're a hoarder, just don't take too much offense to this, but the very base of hoarding is based at, and those, you ever see those TV shows where the people have, like, I mean, their houses are, I've had a relative or two like that. The, <laughs> the, uh, that base of that is fear. It's fear of, of losing, fear of not having something, or they've had such great loss in their life they can't even say goodbye to a plastic bag. But, you know, we do that with other things, but when we go through those fears, that anxiety, that anxiety is not from God. That anxiety is because our pride cannot handle having less. Our pride doesn't want to be taken down, and so we end up becoming anxious and stressed out over the potential of loss and losing something. We become downcast, and that happens, depression sets in, heaviness. You know, heaviness, anger, and anxiety all work together in our mood. And so, but Philippians 4, 6 to 7 says this, just as praise is to the heaviness, just as forgiveness is to the anger, we also find that prayer is to anxiety. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When we pray, like praise to heaviness, when we pray, there's something that happens because we're letting go of the control. We're casting the burden onto Jesus. You know, as people, naturally, we like to fix things. You know, and, and, and there's a danger in always having to fix something. Because when we try to fix things, we don't always have, it's not always within our power. There's a great danger when we try to fix other people. And, you know, it's kind of funny because it, it, it's, uh, I remember reading a statistic once that they said that a majority of people who go, through psych, who go for psychology degrees and stuff are often needing to have some things fixed in their own hearts because they've been through pain themselves. And, yes, there's a process when, we are, when we've been healed of something that we then want to go and be healed helpers. There's an, actual, um, there's an actual good part of that in catharsis. But often it's because, because we want to fix other people because we've been through that pain, but sometimes we want to fix it because it's part of controlling the situation. And in this world, we have to be cautious that we realize we can't fix other people. And when we try to fix other people's problems, we can triangulate issues and make huge issues out of a lot of stuff. We have to be careful that sometimes, you know, my wife sometimes will, will talk with me about things that she's frustrated by. Sometimes she'd come in from work, she'd be frustrated by a situation uh, at, at her job, and I'd be like, can I just call your boss? And she's like, no. She goes, I don't want you to fix anything. I just want to vent. That's guys need to learn something right now. Your wife just wants to talk it out. Don't try and fix it for them. They just need to talk. But the guy in me, because that's what we guys like to do, we like to fix it. Why go up? Ah, go fix. Mm. What we need to do is not try to fix ourselves, but we need to go and pray. You see, we try when there's anxiety, we go to people trying to see if they can help fix it. We go to, we go to uh, friends. We try to do it ourselves, and if that doesn't work, we go and we find substances and other things that make us forget about it because we can't fix it. But what we don't do is we don't stop and pray. God wants us to stop and pray. What's the promise? He says, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus. Jesus came to bring that peace into our lives if we would only turn to him. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 to 7 kind of mimics that verse in James. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You see, peace can come into our heart. God can lift our mood from the unrest and from the anxiety and bring peace into the situation if we will cast the care on him and trust him rather than trusting ourselves. Give it to him. Let him deal with it. Let him control it. And let him deal with it. And let his peace guard your heart. He'll bring calmness into your spirit and peace into your heart about those things. So as we kind of start off, and, and, and I'll, apply, I'll be honest with you, this, reply, this series is going to take us a little bit deeper into February. But as we start off by talking about lift, the first thing we need to focus on, lift our mood. Let's let God take us from heaviness to praise. Let praise take us to that place of being lifted up in our mood. Let us go from, from anger to forgiveness. And let us go from 
anxiety to peace as we engage Christ into our lives, as we engage praise and prayer and forgiveness. Would you bow your head with me? Every eye closed, every head bowed. You might be here this morning. You know, before you can even truly experience some of this lift that I'm talking about, the first lift that we experience is when we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You might be here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior. You know about religion, maybe you know about God, you know who God is, but you are not walking in that personal relationship with him. The sin of this world will hold us down. It will weigh us down. We need the forgiveness of Christ to lift us up. To start that path. To start that process. How can we praise whom we're not serving? How can we pray to a God that we don't serve? The Bible tells us that all of sin and the wages of that sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. God's word also tells us that God loved us so much that he sent his only son into this world. This is how much God forgave. God forgave you and I before we asked him for it. He sent Jesus to pay the price for our sins. He sent Jesus to pay the price, to shed his blood, to satisfy the debt that we owed him before we ever asked him. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God commended this love to you and I when we were still in that sinful condition. God knew that where we were the day that we would give our hearts to him He knew the sins that we would commit, and yet he still sent Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners because he loved us. That if we would just confess our sin, he would be faithful and just, the word tells us, to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's his promise. He stands at the door of our hearts and he says, come on, open up the door of your heart to me. Let me come into you. Let me be your friend. Let me fellowship with you. Let me forgive you, and let's have relationship. God wants a personal relationship with you today, if you would let him into your life. The first place to start lift is to start by surrendering to Jesus as Savior. And so I ask this morning, if you're here in this room and you've not asked Christ to come into your life, Or maybe you did at one time in your life, but you've been far, far away from God, and you need to make a path back to him. I want to give you opportunity to let Jesus come into your heart today. I want to pray with you. I want to pray as a congregation together. If there's anyone here and you need to ask Jesus into your heart and life, they would just raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I see those hands. Anybody else? Anyone else say, Pastor, that's me. I I need to give my heart over to you. Let's pray together. If you just repeat after me, dear Jesus, I come to you today and I need your forgiveness. Lord, I'm sorry for the things I've done. I want to surrender my life to you. Forgive me. Change me. Be the Lord of my heart. Thank you, Jesus for your forgiveness. Help me to forgive others and become the person you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now right now, if you prayed that prayer and you meant that for the first time or if you meant it for the tenth time, the burden that has, you're probably sensing lift already because you're sensing the burden of sin, the weight of wrong falling off of your shoulders. But I want to now pray for you as a congregation. And so with every eye still closed, every head bowed. And if you just, if you did just make a decision for Jesus, if that was your first time or if it was your tenth, would you fill out a connect card for us so we can know and just say, hey, I asked Jesus into my heart today. If it was a rededication, just say, you know, I gave my life back to the Lord today. That's okay. I just want to know about it. If you wouldn't mind doing that, I'd appreciate it. We want to send you some material about that as well for next steps. But church, I want to pray for all of you right now that some of you might be in this room and you're no, you know what I'm talking about when I mention depression. You know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about anger. You know what I'm talking about when we've been talking about anxiety. 
I want to just pray over you as a church. And today, if you have one of those needs in your life, there's nothing to be ashamed of. It happens to all of us. But I just want you to reach out to the Lord. And as I pray, just reach out and let the Lord minister into your heart right now. Dear Jesus, I pray over your church today. And Lord, I know that there's some in this room that they're discouraged by circumstances. They're discouraged. They have no despair. have no hope because of despair. Lord, there are some here today struggling with anger at situations or circumstances. Others, Lord, that are anxious about life. But God, I thank you that you came to lift our mood. So Jesus, as we engage praise, as we engage forgiveness, as we engage prayer, Father, I pray that you lift our moods from these things and lighten our hearts. As we humble ourselves and surrender ourselves to you, God, that you would lift us up as you promised to do that in your word. We cast these cares at your feet and give them to you right now. So Jesus, I pray that you would have your perfect will and way in each of our lives. And Lord, I thank you for that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen.